for us. They are producing wood and they also enrich the air with moisture and oxygen. And all of this is very important for our well-being because we need wood for as fuel wood for construction, for furniture, and the enrichment of the air with moisture and oxygen is important for our survival, as you all know. Now from single trees, we can go to a larger scale, namely forests and on a global scale. And forests are covering about 30% of the land surface, the terrestrial surface, but they store roughly 45% of terrestrial carbon and contribute about 50% of terrestrial net primary productivity. So by these numbers, you see that actually the, the efficiency of forests to sequester and store carbon is higher in comparison to other ecosystems. This is also exemplified in this figure where we can see on the left hand side that non forest areas are covering a much larger area in comparison to forests in blue. But if we then look at the global carbon stock, the relative share of forests is comparably higher, as you would expect from figure A. And finally, um, on average, forests globally sequester 2.4 gigatons of carbon per year, which contributes to roughly 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. So they are an important agent of mitigating climate change. Without forests, we would already have much higher temperatures and much higher greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. From the global scale, we now go to the very local scale, talking about microclimate, forest microclimate. So within a forest, here the microclimate, we have less radiation and perturbation by wind. And therefore we have lower diurnal temperature amplitudes as is exemplified in this panel two of that figure. So we see from the microclimate that diurnal or seasonal temperature fluctuations are dampened in comparison to the macroclimate of an adjacent field or arable land. As a consequence, we also have a higher humidity within the forest and this is beneficial for vegetation. So the dampened microclimate that we see within a forest, as I just mentioned, is beneficial for the vegetation. And now we are coming back to the initial opinion poll that I, that I took. If you see this image, you will most likely already start feeling a little more relaxed. It might be related to the pint that you have been drinking so far, but it may also be related to the positive effects that nature has on us. And therefore it's not surprising that the opinion poll revealed that 94% of all the participants in the opinion, they prefer the environment or the natural setting over an urban setting for recreation. And in fact, there's a whole scientific branch developing over the last decade around the topic of Shinrin Yoko and forest bathing. So this is, um, it, it comes from the Far East, but it's now also uh, popping up in, in Western societies. And here's just a review article on effects of forest bathing on pre-hypertensive and hypertensive adults, which showed that forest bathing, so basically being conscious in the forest, reduces our blood pressure, it lowers the pulse rate, it increases the power of the heart rate variability, which is good. It raises the mood and reduces anxiety. It lowers symptoms of attention deficit disorder. And eventually it also has positive effects on our immune system. And what else do you want in times of a global pandemic? Just go out to the forest and you do yourself something good. Unfortunately, due to the time constraints, I can't go deeper into the positive effects of forest bathing on our physical and psychological well-being. But if you want to have a further read, I can recommend these three books, which I read myself, Your Brain on Nature by Selhub and Logan, The Nature Fix by Florence Williams, or if you prefer German reading, you can also have an introduction to Shinrin Yoko by Yoshifumi Miyazaki, one of the early researchers on the topic from Japan. So answering the first question, why we should care about forests, I would say forests are an egg laying wool milk pig. This egg laying wool milk pig is a very German saying. It's something that if you really desire everything to be perfect, then this is an egg laying wool milk pig because it, it simply doesn't exist. But in my opinion, it does exist, namely with forests. Because if we just quickly recap what they all do for us, they are fundamental for our survival since they provide oxygen for our breathing. They are a very important carbon sink in the global carbon cycle. They provide microclimatic buffers, which is very important for the vegetation, but also our own health. <clears throat> Just recall that when it's very warm in summer, you probably prefer being in a forest rather than sitting on a market square. Forests provide energy and material sources. I'm just talking about timber and fuel wood. And finally, 
They also are very important for our recreation and health, thinking about the forest bathing and the Shinrin Yoku. What I did not yet emphasize on, forests, as we all know, also render hotspots of biodiversity. Just think about the Amazonas or Sumatra, where we have a, the, the, the largest hotspots of biodiversity on Earth, more or less. So from this first question, we go to the next one, which basically is why we should be concerned about forests. And for this, I quickly want to jump back 30 to 40 years in time, coming to the Waldsterben in the 1980s. Back then, people were just, or the, the public just realized that forests were dying and they were dying in vast amounts. Um, the reason for this dieback back then was sulfur dioxide emissions from factories and power plants, which led to an acidification of the rain and consecutively an acidification of soils. And this posed a certain stress to several tree species so that they become more vulnerable to pests and pathogens, such as bark beetles, for instance. And what we see here is an impression from the Bavarian Forest National Park, where the bark beetle calamity almost hit 90 to 95% of all Norway spruce individual trees, since this is a nature reserve and forest, conventional forest logging was prevented. Now, this looks very dramatic, but thankfully, back then, scientists discovered, well, there is a way to, to solve the situation. And so they prevented the Waldsterben. Unfortunately, this term Waldsterben since then has been a little bit um, yeah, difficult in scientific terms, because back then they predicted that forests would vanish from Central Europe by the year 2000. And thankfully, scientists were wrong. But I mean, that, that's it about science. Sometimes we're just wrong and we just come up with hypotheses. And I think it's also because we just realized what was the underlying cause. Now, what does this Waldsterben in the 1980s have to do with today? Well, now scientists, forest ecologists, to some degree are talking about Waldsterben 2.0 in the 2020s. And again, the reason for this Waldsterben, this potential Waldsterben, is a chemical compound. But this time, it's not sulfur dioxide, but carbon dioxide, which you all know is the main agent of climate change. And here I just exemplify climate change with this bar plot, where we see global mean temperatures as derived from the Climatic Research Unit data set, global gridded data set, where we see that the most, the, most of the warmest years have occurred in the past 30 years. And this is a clear indicator of a changing climate, a warming, warming climate. So the higher temperatures, temperatures that we are experiencing with climate change, they result in a higher potential evapotranspiration and a higher vapor pressure deficit of the atmosphere, both of which lead to a higher consumption of water by plants during photosynthesis. And this eventually leads to a higher risk of drought stress for plants because they consume more water, they, they transpire more water to the atmosphere since the vapor pressure deficit is stronger. And that has certain consequences. And we can already see these consequences if we go out to the forest. This is just an, one of many impressions I have seen over the past years. It's from the Steigerwald in Germany in June 2019 when I came back from my vacation in the Netherlands. And I, I just stopped by because I was so surprised to see um, dying trees on this slope. So just, just to make this visual for you, I'm just magnifying parts of this slope. Here we can see some dying Scots pine individuals. I wasn't so surprised to see dying Scots pine because this I encountered earlier after the strong drought of 2015. But the drought of 2018 was so strong that we also saw deciduous tree species dying. It might be a little bit difficult to see on your screen, so I help you by highlighting which canopies actually were dying on this image. And it was not only on this part of the slope that I'm currently magnifying, but it was across the whole stretch of this Steigerwald slope. And not only in the Steigerwald, we found dying deciduous tree species across the whole of Central Europe. And what was particularly surprising was that European beech, a tree species that foresters always have considered as a climate resilient tree species, was heavily affected by dieback after 2018. Now, it's not only drought that comes along with climate change, it's also more intense storm events and a higher frequency, potentially higher frequency of storm events here, just an example of Sabine early in 2020, which hit southern Germany. This is a Norway spruce stand close by the side that I'm living, which was heavily hit by this storm. And besides storms, we also have so-called late frost events. Since under climate change, trees have an earlier phenology, so an earlier bud burst of their leaves, 
But then during nighttime, early in the season, there still is a high risk of frost. And what then happens, you can see here, this is uh, a leaf of beech that was hit in the National Park Bayerischer Wald in May 2020 by a late frost event. So these beech trees basically lost their foliage and they had to rebuild their canopy. And these additional costs of rebuilding the canopy also pose certain stress to the tree species. So answering the question why we should be concerned about forests, they are under stress as in the 1980s. And we have multiple stresses that are induced by man-made climate change. We have hotter droughts, we have late frost, we have more intense storms. And what I didn't talk about yet is alien pathogens. So with a changing climate, we may also experience the invasion of new insects or new fungi, which then also pose certain stressors to tree species. And as a result, we may expect a declining tree health and thus an increasing vulnerability to pests and pathogens, which eventually results in increasing mortality rates. Now, the tricky thing with the Waldsterben 2.0 is it's not so easy to reduce carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. With the sulfur dioxide in the 1980s, we thankfully found a solution, but with carbon dioxide, we are still looking for the solution. And that's a big problem. Before proceeding with the next scientific question, I want to have a very short methodological excursus. So now we are coming more to what I'm currently focusing on. Um, so one of my central research assets is dendrochronology, which you can also translate into something like tree ring science. So how do you get to these tree rings? Well, here you see an image while I'm coring an oak tree with a so-called increment borer. And from this borer, you can then extract these cores and if you then polish the surface of these cores, you can clearly see the distinct ring boundaries, which then can be measured with specific software to obtain measurements of ring widths over time. And these measurements of ring widths over time are proxies for the growth of the tree, the secondary growth of the tree. And basically you can then backtrace in which years a tree was growing very well or just encountered unfavorable conditions and if then relating these fluctuations in ring widths with, for instance, climate data, you can find out what are the main drivers of or the limiting factors of tree growth. And in addition, you can also reconstruct past growth of trees and thereby potentially identify ongoing growth decline of specific tree species under investigation. And this is exactly what we did after the intense dieback of Scots pine after the severe drought of 2015 in southern Germany. What we see here is from a published paper in environmental research letters. So on top, you can see growth as approximated by the so-called basal area increments. And we have two curves. Black represents the trees that survived the drought of 2015 and dead represents the trees that died in 2015. And it is interesting to know that it's not only that they differentiate in the year of 2015 when they died, but they already started differentiating as early as in the 1990s. And then we were looking for possible mechanisms explaining this. And here below, you can see a hypothetical or possible explanation, namely an ongoing drying of the climate as indicated by this water balance index, the SPEI 60, which was relatively or indicates relatively wet conditions up to 1992 but then a consecutive drying of the local climate. But we do not only see this for Scots pine, we also see it for other tree species that show a recent growth decline under increasing drought. Just an example from a study that was published last year in Dendrochronologia, where we compared beech and oak growth performance over time. And we see that after the extreme summer of 2003, beech followed a negative growth trajectory. So basically growth decline and for oak, we also recently encountered some signs of growth decline, and both of which coincide with an increasing drying up of the local climate. So from, with dendrochronology, we can really look into the trees and find out how they perform under specific conditions, and we can also reconstruct conditions from earlier times. But we are also interested in what's actually going on right now. And their dendrochronology is not always the, the best tool, um, particularly if you want to gather information over large areas. And for this, we, we need the second methodological excursus on my scientific assets, which is remote sensing. 
So here you see exemplified a satellite which is measuring spectral information from the Earth's surface. And you have to know that vital vegetation as this green oak on the left hand side, they reflect more in the spectrum of the near infrared and less in the spectrum of the red in comparison to dead trees, which have a lower reflectance in the near infrared and a higher reflectance in the red. And this specific characteristics we can make use of and compute the so-called normalized difference vegetation index, which is the difference of the two normalized by the sum of the two. And that serves as an index to approximate greenness and condition of vegetation. Of course, there are many more indices, vegetation indices that help doing so, but NDVI is one of the most famous. And I will make use of this NDVI in the following slides to approximate the greenness and the condition of the vegetation. First of all, we want to work on a local scale. So this is a forest stand, one of the affected forest stands of the Scots pine dieback in 2015, where we see in blue colors, high NDVI values, in yellow colors, intermediate NDVI values, and the orange colors down here in the south, they represent arable land. So we here have a forest edge, which is particularly highlighted with these yellowish colors. And this you can also confirm statistically, namely that with increasing distance to the forest edge, the NDVI is significantly increasing. Translated in other terms, it means that trees at the forest edge are more vulnerable and particularly prone to drought-induced mortality. And we supported this hypothesis also by dendrochronological means, where we found that also trees at the forest edge, they show different growth patterns and react stronger to drought. If you're interested in further details, you can read the study in environmental research letters. Now, looking at this on a local scale is very nice because you really get detailed insights. But we are also interested in knowing what's actually going on on the large scale. And that brought me to invent the Waldzustands Monitor, the Forest Condition Monitor in 2019. You here see an example of this Forest Condition Monitor. On the left hand side, a map of Germany in August 2020, <clears throat> where you can see that many red colors are spread out over Germany, just few sites are indicated or indicate a high greenness of the vegetation as indicated by the blue colors. And if we look at the temporal development of this forest greenness since the beginning of the monitoring period in 2003, you can see that particularly 2018, 19 and 20 were severe for Germany's forests. So the share of these lower third quantiles are actually twice as high as statistical theory would let you expect. This indicates that we really have stressful conditions in Germany's forests since the extreme drought of 2018. And that matches well also the forest inventory, the so-called Waldzustandserhebung, which is undertaken um, by federal states every year. Now, if you want to have a look at this forest condition monitor, you can look for it in the internet. You will find it on waldzustandsmonitor.de, where you then also can have a look at different years and also the whole of Europe. But you may find that this um, monitor is yet a little bit non-interactive. And this is why I'm currently refining the forest condition monitor. I'm developing a shiny app, which will be online soon. And then you can really start comparing different um, federal districts or different countries of Europe with each other, and also select specifically different dates throughout um, the period from 2003 until today to really make yourself familiar what actually is going on in the forest and what was going on in the past. If you want to get the update when this refined condition monitor is available, you can just follow us on Twitter to get updates. So here you can follow us at forest condition. <clears throat> so answering the question where we currently are, tree rings of several tree species indicate a successive growth decline as a consequence of drying climate. And German forests recently showed a widespread decline in canopy greenness. And this coincides with increased dieback rates of several tree species. As we also learned, forest edges are particularly prone to drought-induced mortality. And this bears the risk of a positive feedback loop, namely, <clears throat> if logging the dead trees at the edge, that will create new edges that are prone to drought-induced mortality. And then you have this feedback loop closed. Now, if forests right now are under stress and we see a widespread decline in greenness and increasing dieback rates, 
well, then we probably also are quite concerned about it. And the question comes, what is to come under climate change? But before addressing this question, I again need some feedback from your side. So we will start the next opinion poll. Please, Enrico, start the next poll asking you, what is your preferred place of residence? Is it A, Southern Europe, exemplified by Napoli in Italy? Is it B, Central Europe, exemplified by the Isermündung in Germany? Or is it C, Northern Europe, exemplified by Rondon in Norway? Please make your vote. Still a few votes coming. <clears throat> okay, maybe we just stop it here. Um, I can stop this and then we can share the results with the audience. Um, yes, so as you see, most of us actually prefer living in the place that we are living in, Central Europe. A few of you, the seven of you who prefer living in Southern Europe, they can actually lean back. You don't need to be afraid of climate change because under severe climate change, we are likely to experience Mediterranean conditions in Germany. So for you, it's probably not a problem. But those of you who are, prefer living in Central Europe or even in Northern Europe, you probably have to migrate if you want to stay in the climate that you currently like. So I guess we can stop this now. The point that I want to make here is if we dislike the climate where we're living, we can move to some other place. Of course, it's it's not very easy, so it, there's a, a huge effort with moving to another place, but still we can do it. For trees, this is simply impossible. They can't unroot themselves and go to another place. So they have to cope with the climate that they experience or they simply die. And that brings us to the next question of this talk. What about the future? If our tree species now are facing increased dieback rates, what is going to happen in the future? And to address this question, we use so-called species distribution models where climate data are used to project the distribution of specific tree species. Here we see the example of Pizzea arbius, Norway spruce, in the historic period of 1970 to 2000, and it matches the actual distribution of Norway spruce relatively well. Well, it's, it's a model, it's a rough simplification of reality. So of course there are some drawbacks here, but it's, it's actually quite helpful to estimate what may happen under climate change. And now we can also use climate projections. So simulations from the ICPP and the so-called CMIP-6 simulations to look into the future under the projected climate, where will Norway spruce grow? And for this, I'm looking into two different periods and for two different scenarios. Scenario one, I call the Greta Thunberg scenario, because this is the scenario which we would need for achieving the Paris Agreement. So reducing the global rise in temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, basically. It's also called the so-called SSP 119, but I think Thunberg scenario is just much easier to digest than this SSP 119. And if now we look to these maps, we see that, well, Norway spruce is still represented in Germany, but yellow means around about 20 to 10%. So the, the abundance probability is relatively low and lower in comparison to the historic period. And at the end of the 21st century, we see that we still encounter Norway spruce in the high elevations of Germany at relatively high abundance probabilities. So this scenario is still somewhat beneficial for the growth of Norway spruce in Germany. But if we look at the other extreme end of the scenarios that are available, I call it the Trump scenario, or you could also call it the Bolsonaro scenario as you want, you see that Norway spruce is just completely disappearing from Central Europe. And this is a really dramatic scenario. This would be a very dramatic case also for forestry because Norway spruce is one of the most important economical tree species in forestry in Germany. Now we don't only look at Norway spruce, we also look at Scots pine. We have already encountered enhanced dieback rates of Scots pine under the ongoing climate change. And here we see similar patterns. So under mild climate change, you may still encounter Scots pine in Germany, but under the Trump scenario, it most likely vanishes from the whole region of Germany and Central Europe and is only then constrained to Northern parts of Europe. European beech, one of our key tree species in German forests, 
yet for the Thunberg scenario, high abundances to be projected. But again, for the Trump scenario, it likely disappears and is constrained to the high elevations in Germany. And it looks similarly for oak, the fourth of our four key species in Germany, the Thunberg scenario, where no problems to be observed, but under the Trump scenario, restriction to the high elevations. And now we wonder, well, if our four key tree species vanish from Germany, which species are likely to come and to survive under climate change? And now we come back to the, to the poll that I just made a few minutes ago. Well, the Mediterranean tree species. So for instance, elephant pine, Pinus halepensis, is projected to grow well under the extreme Trump scenario in Germany. And so is Pinus pinaster. There are other tree species that may also come to Germany under climate change, under extreme climate change. But I think you just got what I want to show you. So we can wrap it up. The future outlook tells us that depending on our efforts to mitigate climate change, the appearance of Germany's forests may change dramatically. Time to breathe. And now you probably think, what a gloomy future. Will our forests look like this at the end of the 21st century? Well, not necessarily. So what can we do about it? First of all, with regards to forestry, we can convert our forests. This is actually already done since 30 years, the so-called Waldumbau, where foresters are seeking to plant climate resilient tree species. They rejuvenate the forests with climate resilient tree species. And thereby they also diversify the forests. This is exactly what brokers do in, in high risk times, they spread their risk. So not only monocultures are planted, but at least two to three, sometimes even four species are planted in one spot and thereby you spread your risk since you, you on the one hand plant species that are growing fast and have a high economic output, but also a higher risk of dying from climate change, but then also other tree species which are more robust to climate change, but may not have this high economic output. For this, however, we need to identify the climate resilient tree species my colleagues at LWF, they have invented the Bayerisches Standort Informationssystem, which provides information to Bavarian foresters. And also the species distribution models I just showed can help to identify these resilient tree species. But we always have to recall that these are models and there is some uncertainty associated with these models. We also need more financial support for the forest-based sector, since foresters have a, a huge amount of work to, to clean up the forests from the droughts of the past years, and at the same time, rejuvenate the forests. At the same, we also need more support for forest-based research to namely identify the resilient tree species, but also to identify management methods which are better under climate change. The primary target should always be to maintain forest microclimates. You probably recall from the beginning that within a forest, you have a dampened microclimate. But if you have to clear cut your forest because all the trees die, then you will have a difficult time in regrowing or rejuvenating the forests since the saplings then are particularly prone to desiccation under drought. And at the same time, we need reference forests in national parks and nature reserves to learn from nature which tree species actually are able to survive under the climate change that we are experiencing. From forestry, we can go one scale up and talk about climate change mitigation in general. So, I guess you agree with me that given what we have seen in the species distribution models, we must not fail to meet the Paris Agreement, since otherwise our forests will just decline. And that means we have to rethink our lifestyle regarding mobility, consumption, carbon footprints. Well, you all know this. And for this, we need political frameworks to create incentives for doing so, because I believe that not all of us voluntarily will rethink their lifestyle and change their way of being. We can also hope to find some technical solutions. The carbon capture and storage would be the equivalent to the filters that they set into the chimneys in the 1980s. But we will see whether this works out. Renewable energies is of course a way to go and fuel cells, and fuel cells in my opinion, are a much better alternative than electric cars because electric cars, they exploit, over exploit Mongolia and the Atacama for lithium. And this is also not very nice. The most important message is any person can contribute. We all can contribute. And many people then say, well, if I do my little contribution, this is like a little droplet on a hot stone and it will Im immediately evaporate. 
But I much better like the saying that if we all join our forces, we can be many droplets that together form a thunderstorm that eventually cools off the stone and the planet. So with this optimistic image, I want to leave you with your thoughts. It's an image from the Bavarian Forest National Park as it looks now. And as you see, we still see many dead tree stumps, but we also see a lot of lush green in between the tree stumps. The forest is regrowing after the Waldsterben in the 1980s. And I believe if we take it in our hands, we can also make the forest survive the 21st century. But we have to recall, it's in our hands, it's our responsibility, and we have to act now. Thank you.